So I'm now going to pass it over to Aureen Zara, assistant curator at the museum and one of the curators for the Paper Routes Women to Watch 2020 exhibition. Hi, Aureen. Hey, Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today um, <clears throat> on our studio tour of another artist featured in Paper Roots Women to Watch 2020. Uh, Women to Watch is a collaboration with all of our outreach committees, uh, both national and international, who, with the support of consulting curators from their regions, help us highlight dynamic contemporary artists working um, in a particular theme that we have uh, chosen. Um, so just first and foremost, I'd like to thank Sarah Steinfeld, Lisa Cannon-Taylor, and the Georgia Committee, as well as curators Michael Brooks and Carson Keith for their excellent nominations of Georgia-based artists working in paper. Um, so as you can guess from the title, Paper Roots, this show is about artists working innovatively uh, with the medium of paper. And when Ginny Trainer, my co-curator for Paper Roots, um, and I, when we were selecting our artists, we really wanted to show the range of what paper could be and what paper could do. It's sort of infinite possibilities. And sometimes these works are big and spectacular, and sometimes they're intricate and subtle. And in Lucha Rodriguez's works, we saw that complex subtlety that we just loved. Um, Lucha has experimented with a variety of media, including copper, textiles, paint, plexiglass, sound, and of course she works with paper. Um, in Paper Roots, we are featuring a number of Lucha's uh, knife drawings. She will um, talk about more in just a, in just a minute. Uh, and these knife drawings, she makes uh, thousands of shallow cuts into the surface of the paper. and They're absolutely beautiful. Um, the knife drawings represent the union between precision and intuition, organic and geometric, and simplicity and complexity. Lucha was born in Caracas, Venezuela. She received her BFA in graphic design at the Art Institute of Atlanta and earned an MFA in printmaking at Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD. Uh, during her career, she has been featured in many exhibitions, group and uh, single per single uh, solo exhibitions in the US, as well as internationally in India, Mexico, China, and France. Her work is included at SCAD, uh, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, um, as well as various private institutions and collections. Um, so with that, it's great to have you here, Lucha, and I'll hand it off to you now. Thank you so much for the introduction. It was a great introduction, thank you. Um, I just also want to extend my thanks to the Georgia Committee for amplifying our voices as Georgia-based artists. And I don't take opportunities like these for granted. So thank you for all, all that you have done for the past two years. It's been a pleasure just to be selected in this sort of artistic family. That's how it feels, definitely. Um, I want to start talking about the knife drawings because those are the works that are gonna be included in the exhibition. And I'm going to do a screen share. Okay. It should be working right now. Excellent. So a little bit of a disclaimer, I would say these knife drawings are meant to be viewed in person, not through RGB light technology. So if you do have issues seeing what's on the screen. Um, I would recommend that you adjust the brightness of your screen, of your device, and that way you'll be able to have a better experience of viewing the work because it is that interactive and it's very subtle. So that's why you need to be aware of the brightness of the device that you're using. Okay, so for these nice drawings, what you're experiencing with these first slides is actually a single solid square that it's done with a wash of watercolor. And all the lines and divisions that you see are actually achieved by having the light in, on the surface of the paper at a different angle. And I do that by making these tiny incisions that are just going to redirect the light over the surface of the paper. 
and it's easier said than, than done, right? <laughs> like with everything. It's very process driven. And, um, and I was thinking about the idea of creating lines but not graphically drawn onto the surface of the paper, but actually the experience of a line that was done by the collection of a repetition of small action, actions that we do. So it's a matter of collecting your perspective and then every day doing all of these small actions that actually create all of these lines, all of these paths. And I was also thinking about that experience of, you know, the words that we use, how we look at each other, all those small details that we have in everyday life, and how that sort of determines this path that you choose for yourself. And, and it's just a visual exercise that you have something that it's the same color, it's the same material, it's the same surface, but then you start seeing all of these lines and divisions and borders. And it's just a matter of that repetition of selecting your perspective, your opinion every day, and then you have all of these breaks. Um, so I really wanted to just use the paper more efficiently and connect to it um, as I did with printmaking. All of my background is in printmaking, where, where you learn how to apply ink onto surface. And then that could be, sort of like just sitting on top of the paper, or it can actually go through the fibers of the paper. So you understand that the material has this depth to it. You can use that thickness of the material. And instead of just viewing it as a flat sub substrate, I would just think of it more in terms of a culture almost where I'm using the actual light of the space to activate the color within the drawing. So it's this mix of a drawing that it's that it's existing in this sort of pictorial space, but it's actually using physical light to manipulate color and forms on the way we are perceiving all of these shades, which I find that it's I just love making them. <laughs> Um, it really helps me connect with the material and with what's around me. And you can see here, there's this close up of the knife drawing where you can see that I'm making all of these tiny incisions. They're very superficial. I don't go all the way through the material. I'm not poking the material. You know, if you flip the, pa the paper, then you won't see anything on the back of the paper because these, um, these cuts are very, very superficial. And it's just a matter of understanding how light interacts with paper and how subtle changes can actually be viewed and experienced uh, differently. And that one, I want to include this one because you can see the actual color that I apply on the surface of the paper, that it's this, subtle wash of watercolor. And then you see these two sort of, you see the line in the middle and the two that are done diagonally. And it's just done with the manipulation of the paper and the light doing all the work, <laughs> actually. So it's beautiful. I feel I'm in collaboration with light constantly and I'm just setting the stage for it to to control what's happening with our perception because that's how seeing works. You know, you always have light coming into your eyes. We have all of these optical lenses going on. And, um, and that's the beauty of it. It's something that it's a, it's, it's a living drawing that, you know, if you light it in different ways, um, you might be able to see everything with detail, but, if you turn it around or moving more towards one side or the other, it might be too bright and you lose everything. So it's just a matter of connecting and looking intensely and being present with what's in front of you. For this square, I wanted to explore a little bit more about the fluid line. And because sometimes when you think about borders and lines, they're in constant negotiation. It's not just this 
sort of steady line that goes in the same direction. And I wanted to do something that would study that sort of fluid relationship in between. And, and this is a close up of it. And you can see that heart shadows start to appear. And the more you concentrate, you can see the, the subtle shadows that are lighter or darker, depending on where you stand or how you see the work. And I, I'm, I, I'm showing the whole knife drawing and then I'm giving you some close-ups because that's sort of the way you would interact in a gallery or museum space. You would see the work and maybe see a little bit of a, a tint of a color and then you actually have to walk towards it and have this intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship to start activating your seeing abilities in order to read and and see what's happening. Uh, Here Richa, is, so, sorry to interrupt, just because we have a question um, as you're talking yeah. about the kind of size. How large are these works? Uh, have, are they all sort of the same size? Is there the largest you've made, you know, uh, of a particular type of knife drawing? Some are 22 by 30. I also have others that are 40 by 60. And they are done on watercolor paper. So, Okay. So sometimes I'm restricted by that. <laughs> yeah, and, and so definitely like they're big, but they're not so huge that you can get all of those details standing from far away. That they, they do command you to come really close to be able to see these details. Yeah. Yeah. These works are definitely very demanding and time consuming. And they the viewer actually needs to have some sort of openness. To view the work because you can easily just walk in front of it and dismiss it but if you have that curiosity and if you have that openness to see what's going on then you can come close to it and it starts happening so that's why i say that it's you know seeing starts way before you open your eyes you have that disposition to to actually have the time, put in the time to see something and interact with it and understand it. So, um, yeah, that was the, the sample for that. And then I also wanted to explore, you know, just the gestural quality of paper, that it's not just rigid, that you can have a brush stroke and you can infuse it with that energy with the cuts, that the, the cuts are not static. They're, they can actually freeze something in moment, but at the same time, still make it very flexible. And you can see the tiny cuts that are given a different rhythm than the bigger cuts that, are, that feel sometimes more still. So it's a play and a balance that happens within these nice drawings. Uh, and it comes from, the ability to see each element. You see the cut, how much space that does the cut take, then how much space of a heart shadow you get, and the subtle shadows that happen around it. And then by being aware of every single thing that's going on, you can make space for each of them and then have a very balanced composition and something that will be more harmonious at the end of the day. And I think we can apply that to so many aspects of our lives too. There's nothing that feels better than, you know, being acknowledged and having your own space. Um, and it creates harmony both in humans and also within this field of art, you know. And this one is sort of like an in progress shot that I, I wanted to share because you can actually see how how much of the depth of the paper I can explore. Some cuts really raise up from the actual flat level of the paper and you can truly manipulate it beautifully to create different effects. Um, and here you can explore more of the it's sort of like these excavation 
journeys that I go into when I'm working with the paper. I I select different weights and then I come in with my exacto knife and I start exploring making the cuts and seeing how far I can go without breaking the paper. There's something that it's really rewarding to make something that is just a single material and then it starts breaking into different surfaces and just studying it and open it up in a way that light can activate it and then you have a different understanding of what's happening. So is there is there room for error when you're working and you're kind of extending yourself and seeing how far you can go. Uh, if you do break the paper, do you have to start over or do you kind of adapt it? Well, I have a little bit of both. Yeah, yeah it's a, a little bit of both. I think that without, you know, with, without making mistakes, going through the paper, making marks that are just, you know, sometimes you flip and then you can't control those things. But then I allow that to happen and then I come up with new ways of cutting because of all the mistakes that I've made. <laughs> and um, that's how it goes. I'm just doing little studies all the time. And sometimes they don't, they don't look good. They don't work at all. And then I have to start again. But I think to me, it's part of that exploration of finding my own line um, that communicates my experience as a human being, but it's also this sort of visual exercise that exists in this plane. So, so yeah, I allow mistakes to happen. It happens to all of us, and it's fine. Part of the process. This one for the circle, it's more of trying to control a gradient and see how it appears and disappears. It's actually just a flat, flat color and you have that sort of border that starts to emerge. And that separation is just created with all of these tiny little cuts. I think that the close-up really shows that it's the same value, <laughs> the same color. And then when you're, when you're further away, you see like it's a different, darker color, but it's actually the same. And I'm still trying to pay attention to what is happening and that way I can grow from it and try different things. So I have to always be open in the studio and look around, <laughs> even at how the paper is playing on my, on my table and how the light is hitting it. It's always being aware of what's going on with the material. I do spend a lot of time outside. I make the cuts in the studio, but I have to interact with light all the time. And um, so there, I make some smaller ones that are more portable and I just have a bunch of test cuts. And here's another one. That way I understand what happens with the positioning of the paper outside. And if, if not, then I just work by a window and this body of work really shifted my, the way that I work and the hours that I can work. Now I have to work during the day. So it's more of office hours for me. Before I would be a night owl, but the nice drawings just won't allow it. I have to be an early bird now. And um, yeah, these nice drawings don't come from you know, just like, oh, I want to make a nice drawing and this is what's happening now. I'm constantly investigating and I hang all of these tiny ones all over my studio to see what happens with different colors, different times of the day. How can I replicate that? Can I control it or not? I have lots of prisms in the studio and um, I think it's important to share what, what the artist notices within their space, what's important to them, because sometimes that's what permeates onto their bodies of work, or that opens up new possibilities for them. And to me, it's light. And the way you see the spectrum of light to sort of coloring 
these this nice drawing that it's just so beautiful that I I thought I have to use the physical light. There's no way I can paint something as beautiful as that. I but I wanted to be part of the work. And the knife drawings are flat, but like I say, I I'm, I go outside and I build all, all of these sort of wall structures and just do experiments and I fold them, I twist them. This is a study that I did with four paper cups. I just opened the paper cups and flattened them out and I took out the bottoms of the paper cups. This, I'm constantly just twisting and bending the material, ripping it apart just to study it, dissect it. Um, I, did, I did all of these uh, paper cup studies in upstate New York when I was in a residency. Uh, these are recycled uh, paper cups that we had there that we were using. And you can see all the sort of circular shapes are all the bottoms of the cup. And I'm constantly just thinking about how can I create lines? So I think of it like it's a drawing actually, like just making lines that are darker or lighter, but I'm just tearing the material apart. And here is a sketch of one of the nice drawings. And you can see all the little tiny arrows that I do. Um, because that's the way the work is created. I have to explore how the light's gonna hit the paper and everything. So there's a lot of prep work before I get to cutting, which is my favorite part. And this is sort of like an up to scale. Just a uh, quick question, Lucia. Um, do you cut first, add color later? For this, piece in particular, this one I did the watercolor first, but there are other ones that I do come in and apply color afterwards. But for the images that I'm showing right now, it's first the watercolor base. Mm -hmm. And here you, you can see up to scale my ergonomic knife handle with my blade and just all the little tiny cuts. There are more than 10,000 cuts in each of the knife drawings. Um, and in a sense, it's, I can't just get lost and, and start cutting. I do have to be present. I do know that I have to change directions of when I'm cutting, that it's not something that it's totally with my intuition. So I'm always in this balance between, okay, if this is pre-planned, but I also get lost in them, but not too much. <laughs> and the series of the Papagayos, um, these are really close to my heart. They're very personal works. Um, I don't usually do it, but for this series, I allowed myself to study the idea of the papagayo, which are Venezuelan kites. Um, kites in Venezuela are very important. They're part of our popular folklore, our culture. We learn how to fly kites at school for PE. Um, but for the past 15 years, they have been used as banners for protests um, just to show the discontent towards the government and seeing this symbol being used as something else rather than just for people to enjoy them and fly them around, that, um, that I had to make this series to just to explore that symbol and my relationship to it. But for me, the, I just rely on context, personal context. If, if the person wants to know, if the viewer wants to know more about it, then it's fine. But for me, it's more about the idea of slow change, change not happening right when people need it the most, that it causes all of this despair and suffering. Um, and it really helped a lot to sort of like creating these lines and, and thinking about also the division of within countries, within communities that are the same. Um, and this sort of like the circular shape on top that has no watercolor, um, that feels more like a sphere, that it's just done with, um, with the paper and I come in and just cut around it to give you an idea of that sort of sphere. 
But all of these shapes are based on different um, kites in Venezuela. If for different regions, we have different shapes of them. So basically, it's, it's just a take on that. Um, and thinking about that slow change, but going through it, it's a different thing. And you can see this one here. A close up of it. There's something about this intrinsic conflict, separation of sameness that I have been studying through these knife drawings. And it, it has made me more aware of everything and it has helped me connect with people. And I think that's the beautiful thing about art. It's such a beautiful tool that helps you open up to see more, to have a fuller life. So for me, if someone is just taking the time to come close to a nice drawing and experience it, and it somehow opens up their seeing a little bit, then I get just satisfaction, <laughs> definitely. And I wanted to include um, a, a photograph for, from our Georgia Women to Watch exhibition that happened this past January. Um, I, I highly recommend that you look up all the other Georgia women artists who are super talented. Sanas Nagari, um, Whitney Stansel, Amy Wambo, Jerusha Graham. Um, you can go to the Georgia Committee's website, but yeah, just check out what's happening here in Georgia with the art. It's, it's so exciting. So I just highly recommend it if you're interested. And yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I was at that opening um, in Atlanta and it was just such a wonderful event. Um, so yeah, I, I, the art scene in Atlanta is so powerful and compelling and the artists for Paper Roots, all nominated artists were so extremely strong and all doing such different kinds of paper art, um, which was just fascinating to see all of you uh, exhibited together in that space. Um, so I, I've, I had a lot of questions come in as you were speaking, so I just sort of, if you didn't mind, sort of interrupted you and sort of asked those. I think a lot of these questions are relevant to what you were talking about at the time. And I also wanted to go back a little bit to this idea of um, the three things that I'm seeing that you've talked about that are, they play equal roles, which is the color, the light, and the texture, the texture made through the cuts that you're making in the paper. Do you think about these things, the, these three elements simultaneously, or is this, there's one that you focus on first and the others kind of follow? Is it the cuts that come first? Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you sort of conceive and proceed with the works? I think it's a, it's a constant study and exploration. I don't just stop and create a shape I'm always doing things in the studio. And sometimes I do create shapes like the circle, for example, that's going to help me study a specific behavior of light in a way. But um, I'm just constantly making them and one informs the next and the next. And it's like a domino effect for me. Uh, but definitely, I think, um, once I understand what's happening with different shapes and light, then I can add that second layer of, okay, now that I have all of this visual vocabulary, what, can, what else can I do with it and how can I push it forward? Yeah, I, I think from what I was seeing, I mean, if it were me, I would get so swept away and constantly make the cuts and constantly make all these marks. And to me, it, it seemed like the key to achieving this really harmonious effect that you have is kind of knowing when to stop. So, <laughs> and, and your works seem so balanced and, and um, harmonious as I, as I mentioned. So when do you know when, you're, when your work is finished? Is it when you sort of achieve what you were thinking of in your sketch, uh, in your drawing, or can you just get a feel for it once you kind of like take back, take, take a look back at it? Um, sometimes I even make work three times until I, I just finish them. I have the sketch and I'm done with it. And then I look at it and it doesn't feel finished. I don't get that gut feeling that it's done. And 
if it's not interesting enough, then I try again until I get excited about looking at it. If I'm not excited, then I'm, I don't I don't use it as part of my body of work. I just call it another exploration, and and that's how it goes for me. I'm I'm always gonna be cutting and working with different materials because that's just who I am. It's in my nature to keep my hands busy making all the time. So there's there's no not a distinction for me. It's just that one ones that I in my gut I feel that are part of a body of work and I keep them there. So, mm -hmm. How you said that you speaking of experimentation that you worked with different kinds of paper and now you work with watercolor paper. Uh, is there a favorite kind of paper or is a type of paper that you prefer? What is it about watercolor paper that you work with uh, mainly? Well, at first, um, I was just using PSK paper and anything that would be more, that it had more of a body to it. Uh, I had to start making the nice drawing with um, very heavyweight watercolor because I didn't have the control to make this sort of superficial cuts. I had to practice a lot, a lot to sort of like start working with paper that wasn't as heavyweight. But that's just through practice, trial and error. Um, but that was my first thought, like, okay, I'm making these cuts and it's not working. I want more, more depth. Then I, that's how I started working with really heavyweight um, texture watercolor. And the watercolor was the thing that I found. It was actually closer to the effect of light. It was still translucent. And the way it was grabbing onto the surface of the paper sort of reminded me of that fluidity of light um, over each cut. I've tried um, acrylics, I've tried pastels, different things to work with the, with the knife drawings and it just, it, it didn't work. Uh, so the watercolor paper allows me to keep that flat surface, that pristine surface and still be able to use the watercolor. And to me, it's important to leave all of the lightness of the paper intact. I don't want it to be distracting. I just want that tiny space of the night drawing to be this one-on-one -on -one thing that you're relating to. Yeah, I love the negative space that's on these works and then you just have these sort of that's what I meant but I think I would get swept away and the entire thing would be yeah. <laughs> little little fillets in there little cuts and then it would lose that effect I think that you that you have um just a question in the Q&A uh to repeat the name of the exhibition that was held in Atlanta of the various uh women artists so this was uh, the Georgia Committee sort of opening or a celebration of the five nominated artists from Georgia for uh, women to watch uh, to, to the person who was uh, asking. So that was held in January and the exhibition closed when in March? I think. It actually, yeah, it got extended. We yeah, had extended. even an extra month, so yeah. it was beautiful. Yes, um, and Carolyn just posted, a, the, the link in the chat if you're interested. Um, they're all fabulous artists. Um, there are a couple of things that I've heard you talk about before uh, that I would love for you to you know, mention here. You said you're, uh, before that your father was a surgeon, right? And that that sort of affected your, your art making. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um... I have always been aware of our internal space as human beings, just from looking at my dad, he would bring videos home from, you know, from different operations and I'd be like, okay, this is not what, this is not for me, but there was something about viewing the human being and sort of having an external and internal space that sometimes we're not aware of. Uh, that to me, it was just fascinating and it clicked with me that, okay, I do have this sort of organs inside of me and, but I'm not really interested in that part. I'm more interested in a space for creativity, a space where I can think about and reflect and, and be self-aware. But that also felt sort of like something that was internal 
and yeah and also just the precision with the blade <laughs> from looking at my dad he had so many scalpels uh he would even cut the newspaper with it all day so i do think i do have a close relationship <laughs> with scalpels and blades and all yeah, of that I, I read in an interview that uh your father said that you should have been a neurosurgeon or something because <laughs> of of the uh the extreme precision that you use in your works and and when i look at the forms that you create in these knife drawings um and even sort of your site-specific installations they're very they, they look like or, organic things like organic forms and matters and they look like sort of bimorphic shapes um but i also understand that they're not supposed to be literal things that you find in your body or in your nature they're not illustrative in that way they're more sort of evocative of, of something that you're feeling um you're sensing inside so i think that's that's sort of like you get you, you can sense inspiration that you get but also how you're sort of um kind of coming into your own and kind of looking at it through through your sort of artist's eyes. But I definitely sense that sort of, I don't know, that inspiration that you might find in the scientific world, the natural world, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also this relationship about your eyes and your hands. And it's this constant thing of being aware through your eyesight and then coming close enough to the material. I cut so close that I can smell the paper. <laughs> Of that coat and the this sort of sense of touch that people start to see that there was this hand that started creating all of these small drawings all of these small little cuts and then you start reading it almost like words and just being aware that somebody touched that surface so many times that it also activates something in the viewer for them to exist in their bodies that i find that it's a beautiful connection i i definitely agree i think there's such a um, uh like a sensual kind of experience that you have with your works like when you see your works there's that tactile quality you just you just want to run your hands over it it's it's it really does kind of pull you in in that way and you have this sort of visceral reaction to it so you're not just experiencing and i've noticed that with a lot of our paper artists you're not just experiencing their works with your eyes, you're experiencing with other of your other senses as well. Um, tell us about your love of pink. <laughs> you didn't mention that in this uh, in in your presentation here, but I know that that color uh, plays a big role in in your work overall. I think it's it's for the same reasons as well. Um, when I'm creating these works, I want people to really exist in their bodies there's something about this tonality of pink that really works well to activate your sense of touch in your eyes and to keep it in this sort of bubble. You know, you're feeling something and you are in your body. And uh, it's such a flexible color. You know, you have, you have all of this sort of fluorescent pink that are more plasticky and then you start coming into all of these different shapes that are more related also to the internal body you know the inside of your mouth and taste and smell and so many different things that i'm i'm very attracted to uh, when you see some some of the cuts it also could you know it also feels sort of like a pattern that could exist on a skin too. And if you change the color and you make it, let's say, green, it doesn't have the same power. You start thinking about the leaves and then, and then you activate something else in your brain that's just going to separate you from the body. Did you, uh, get, did you ever get your hands on um, uh, Stuart Semple's World's Pinkest Pink? pigment oh <laughs> i think you can buy it online yes yes you can totally just buy it online <laughs> it's pigment. it's a pigment that's a reflective pigment that's supposed to be extremely fluorescent um yes yeah so i mean i when i when i heard about your love of pink that's what i thought like i wonder if you've ever used it before if you've gotten your hands on that are you ever interested in creating your own own shade of pink, like a Lucha Rodriguez pink, the way we have Eve Klein blue, you know, like that would be something really, really cool. 
It would be just universal pink. If yeah. I could just make a batch of pink and just give it away. And yeah. I don't care about naming it my color. I just want more people to use the color yeah. and get the experience. Even just dipping your hands in paint with different colors. It gives you different temperatures. It gives you just a different relation. So I, I highly recommend it. Just use more pink and then you'll see what happens. <laughs> see i think maybe i'll ask uh let me see a couple more questions so uh somebody asked a question about exhibiting these works the knife drawings because you talk about how you you really need sort of natural light to make them but they're often exhibited under gallery lights which is how they will be exhibited in in paper routes as well because we don't uh I don't really have windows on the on, yeah. on the floor. So, uh, what is your? I mean, how would you? How? What were the different ways that you displayed the knife drawings? Do you prefer that they're in certain kinds of lighting? Just having flat lights. Flat lights just work really well with them, yeah. and it lighting is crucial because you can make them disappear and. Sometimes it happens that some of them, you, you just lose them a little bit and I'm okay with because they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Reacting to the different light conditions actually. And um, I, I've, I've worked with different preparators in different galleries and museums. And um, just as long as everything gets flooded with light, it will be fine. You can see the texture of the paper, which is, beautiful and then you see the little cuts floodlights it's all you need i i spend time outside and i work with them through the windows because i'm creating them but mm -hmm. once i have that working then then they work everywhere else which yeah. Is great. yeah and in some ways they're they're i mean you've already made them but they are kind of responding to each space because they're responding to the light the you know the the light settings in that particular space so in a way they're they're site responsive and now which is yeah. really nice yeah. yeah so yeah they're just always that those lines are always being created and when the light hits them if not they're all going to look like just a flat rectangle with nothing on it well, we're so excited to see those in person and have them in our in our um, um, galleries. Um, I've seen some of the, your works in the Atlanta show, uh, and I can't wait to see these particular ones because the ones in Atlanta were were slightly different. Um, in fact, I don't think they were the knife drawings, were they? Yes, they were. They were knife drawings. Okay. They, they were, were knife drawings. Yeah. Um, well, I can't wait to see these in person. We're so excited and. Thank you, Lucha, for speaking to us um, today and for showing us these beautiful works. Um, seeing some works, is, are those certain works behind you right now? Or are, is that something else that I'm seeing? Is that... Um... <laughs> I always have something going on as yeah. well. I, these are all just circles. These are all circles and then I bent them in different ways. This is a structure that is just done with circles. Some circles are just bent this way, yeah. bent that way. And then I can see how the light is reacting to them. Yeah, I always I, have to see what's going on with paper. <laughs> yeah, it's been catching my eye the whole time. And I, I keep meaning to ask you about it. And I keep, I keep like thinking about something else. But yeah, so thanks, Lucha. Thank you to the Georgia Committee um, for just all your support of Women to Watch um, over the years, not just in 2020. Um, and the show is slated to open October 8th. Um, we're getting ready for it, and we hope people can come see the show in person. So uh, thank you again, and uh, last, last words, Carolyn? Yeah, I just want to um, second those. Thanks, Lucha. It's been so nice to get to know you over these past weeks and also uh, to get to hear from you directly and explore your art. Um, I can't wait to, to see it in person. And I think especially in this, this current world we're living in, it's so great to hear from you and see you in your space um, and explore your work and 
color and light and everything. It's, it's amazing. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Aureen, for leading us uh, this afternoon per usual. Um,